I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a fighting chance for some of the most vulnerable victims from the devastating wildfires in Northern California. The teachers and students working 24-7 to save them. San Diego communities divided over a ban aimed at protecting the environment. I'm Amitha Sharma. The vessel for leftovers at the heart of the debate. Also, hands-on with the greatest show in Televent at Balboa Park. The flights of fancy inspiring inventors, young and old. She's my baby and I wouldn't want to buy anything else, that's for sure. Soaring over San Diego, advice from the newest member of the Blue Angels as she inspires more women to climb into the cockpit. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Giving former inmates a second chance, a new bill by Assembly Speaker Tony Atkins of San Diego will use state funding to help them transition back into communities. Governor Jerry Brown signed it into law today. The program will use savings from Proposition 47, the voter-approved measure that reclassified some felonies to misdemeanors. The new law will use the money to help with housing, behavioral health care, drug treatment, and other services. Hundreds of deported migrants with serious mental illnesses may have a chance to return to the U.S. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero tells us about a new legal settlement. The settlement is between the American Civil Liberties Union and the Department of Homeland Security. It covers deported migrants with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and other mental illnesses. They can apply to have their immigration cases reopened if they meet certain conditions. For example, they must have represented themselves in immigration court. They must also have been detained in the states of California, Arizona, or Washington after November 21st of 2011. I spoke to Bardis Vakili of the ACLU. He says the settlement is supposed to offer relief to those migrants who should have been assigned an attorney. In general, migrants facing deportation don't have a guaranteed right to counsel. Immigrant detainees are already fighting this, these battles with one arm tied behind their back. And for these particular vulnerable uh, detainees who, who have severe mental health issues, the fight is nearly impossible. The ACLU is in the process of contacting those who may be eligible to come back across the border. Vakili says as many as 900 deported migrants may qualify. The class action lawsuit was first filed in 2010, and the settlement extends relief to others deported while the case was unfolding. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. A college uh, community in Oregon in mourning after a mass shooting killed nine people. The campus held a candlelight vigil last night at Umpqua Community College. We are learning more about the victims. They ranged in age from 18 to 67. The oldest was a teacher. A federal agency says the man who opened fire on campus yesterday had body armor. He was armed with three pistols, a rifle, and five additional magazines. Still fighting for their lives, hundreds of animals suffering burns from the wildfires in Northern California. Midori Sperandio says vet teachers and students at UC Davis are working around the clock. Meet Amber, not Amber, a six-month-old kitten who was rescued from the ruins of the recent wildfires. She was found wandering through the soot and ash with no place to go. You can see the, the burns on the tips of her ears and her whiskers got quite singed and that's why they're curled and short. So Amber, like all the cats here, was given a fire-inspired name by her rescuers like Singe, Bernie and Phoenix. Veterinarians are working long hours cleaning and wrapping her burn paws, the most common wound they're seeing come out of the fires. A lot of cats lost their paw pads actually, um, so they won't ever regain their paw pads back. 40 cats and kittens are being housed and cared for here. Many were left behind when their owners' homes burned down. Others may have been barn cats, unable to outrun the fire. And so a lot of kitties were outdoor and just scattered, you know, took off um, and couldn't be caught. It'll be a few weeks before these kitties are healthy enough to be released. But many of them are still unclaimed, which means they'll have to be put in their local animal shelter. Many people may not know that their pets survived the fire or may not know where to look for them. Some cats have been claimed and will be reunited with their families once they're healthy enough to leave. 
For now, they're getting plenty of attention, care, and love. I take them in my exam room, I play the radio, and we, you know, brush them and pet them. One cat did die from severe burns, but the rest of this group is expected to make a full recovery, including Ember, who no longer has a family or home, but thanks to her rescuers, has a second chance at life. In Sacramento, Midori Sperandio reporting. One of the longest serving cabinet members of the Obama administration is stepping down in December. Education Secretary Arne Duncan has served seven years. When, uh, my mother started an inner-city tutoring program before we were born and raised all of us as a part of that program, and that changed our lives. In all our life, we saw what kids could do when they were given a chance, and that's why we do this work today. He was known to clash with lawmakers on both sides of the political aisle. Throughout his tenure, he stood firmly behind federal standardized testing. Duncan plans to return to Chicago, where his family lives. Obama tapped Duncan's deputy, John King Jr., to serve as acting secretary through the end of his presidency and declined to nominate him to be secretary, avoiding a confirmation fight in Congress. Curbing sexual assaults, Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill mandating all high school students take a sex education class unless their parents object. It includes learning about the state's new sexual consent policy, teen relationship abuse, sexual harassment, and inclusion of different sexual orientations. The law goes into effect next year. Those takeout containers we know and love are now at the heart of a new debate. Amitha Sharma has more on the changes aimed at saving the planet and how they divide communities in San Diego. Styrofoam containers are relatively cheap and they keep food warm. Restaurants love them for takeout, but styrofoam creates tons of waste and poses risks to the environment. Solana Beach and Encinitas are poised to become the first cities in the county to ban the foam. Joining me to discuss the proposed bans are Roger Kuby of the Surfrider Foundation and Steve Amster, owner of Garden State Bagels in Encinitas. Roger, let's start with you. Why should styrofoam be banned? Uh, thanks, Amita, first for having me on today. Um, the Surfrider Foundation's mission is the protection of our oceans, ways, and beaches. Um, so we're on the forefront of the, of the pollution issue uh, in, on our beaches and in our ocean. Um, and typically, on, on average, each year, uh, Surfrider Foundation and San Diego, County, uh, San Diego Coast Keeper volunteers uh, in about 45 public beach cleanups pick, over, pick up over 20,000 pieces of uh, styrofoam uh, off of their beaches. Um, styrofoam, actually it's polystyrene, um, is uh, lightweight in its nature. So if we're picking up over 20,000 pieces of styrofoam on the beach, as you can imagine how much is actually entering our ocean. Um, in addition to the environmental impact, there's also impact on marine life. Uh, there's also impact to our economy. And a recent study that came out actually about five days ago has evidenced that uh, along with uh, the plastic pollution is actually entering our food stream through fish. Uh, approximately 25% of the fish that we um, eat in the state of California uh, has either um, uh, plastic pollution in those fish. So there's a human health concern, there's an economic concern, there's an environmental concern, and then also its impact on marine life. Now, Steve, you're opposed to the ban. Why? Because um, it's fully recyclable. If the city of Encinitas would provide more trash receptacles, people would use them and stuff wouldn't end up in the ocean. But no, so Steve says it's fully recyclable, but I heard only large styrofoam is fully recyclable. Do you know differently? Um, so currently, um, the, so every waste management company is a little bit different in San Diego County. Um, EDCO is Encinitas' waste management company. They uh, do accept cleaned out polystyrene foodware containers. I spoke with the vice president of EDCO about this situation, and he told me that while they do accept them in their recycle, in the recycle bins, they prefer to not have them in the recycling stream because what happens often, the majority of them um, have food still in those containers, and they immediately are discarded as opposed to recycled. Um, he prefers the large block packaging recycled um, or packaging uh, styrofoam that's used like when you buy a TV for example. Okay so Steve now I know that a lot of people in the food industry don't want styrofoam to be banned because it's, it's cheaper to use. How much more expensive are the alternatives? Well the prices I got were about three times as much to replace them with other um, you know cardboard containers and um, 
the other thing that wasn't mentioned was um, the when you use paper cups, they're lined with wax, and um, they the styrofoam will break down um, better in less time than than paper cups because and and the other issue is we're not replacing trees in the in this country as fast as they're tearing them down to make paper uh, paper plates and paper cups so so that's an you know that, that's detrimental to our health by not having enough trees because um, they're tearing them down faster than they're growing them so Roger what about this point that that uh, Steve is making sure. I mean, there's a couple good points the first point being the uh, increase in cost to uh, restaurants we're certainly um, empathetic to that we don't want to run we don't want a ban like this to run anyone out of business fortunately uh, about 80 jurisdictions in the state of California have already passed an ordinance like this um, and evidence from those uh, jurisdictions that have passed ordinances is, is demonstrating that businesses uh, are not going out of business due to a polystyrene foodware ban. Uh, the other uh, point on that is, you know, ultimately the expense to the environment, to our human health, to marine life, and to our economy as a result of disposable plastics like polystyrene um, is way greater than an, a, a minor increase in the cost of doing business, which can be passed along to the consumer. Um, and certainly, again, uh, the uh, benefits of removing these type of products from circulation that do not compose, that do not decompose, that break down into smaller and smaller pieces, end up uh, being mistaken as food for fish, uh, that is a greater expense than a minor increase to the cost. And we're going to close it there. Roger, Steve, thanks so much for coming on the program. The Encinitas Environmental Commission will discuss the proposed styrofoam ban at its next meeting on Thursday, October 8th at 5.30 at City Hall. California lobster season starts this weekend, and the Coast Guard has some safety tips after six dive-related deaths last year off the Southern California coast. California's spiny lobsters are nocturnal, hiding in crevices during the day and coming out to feed at night. They can grow up to two feet long, and most adults average about a foot. Diving for lobsters isn't for everyone. You must have a fishing license and experience, says Lieutenant Commander Chris Jehovitz with the Coast Guard. You're actively trying to grab the lobsters, maintain a hold of them while monitoring your uh, air pressure in your tank, your location under the water, and especially at night you have a light. Um, so all those other factors play into it that it's more of an activity for the experienced diver. Safety experts say many accidents stem from people underestimating the hazards. That's why the Coast Guard is reminding divers to never go alone and be aware of any medical conditions that might affect you underwater. Fatigue may have played a factor in five of the six deaths reported during last year's lobster season in Southern California. A lot of them had a pre-existing medical conditions um, with their self that I can't get into, but that contributed with along with the locations that they were diving in. Uh, fatigue most definitely probably played a factor in getting to their location. Divers should also be aware of weather and sea conditions before they go out. Lobster season runs from October through early March. Woo! By the way, the spiny lobster has two large antennae, which produces a loud noise to keep predators away. Despite having no claws on its legs, I'm told they're very delicious, and you can find them up and down the coast from Monterey down to Mexico. The Scripps National Spelling Bee scores the primetime spotlight and all the big prizes in New Mexico. Fronteras reporter Simon Thompson shows us another competition trying to build up a buzz of its own. Omnisciencia. O M N I S C I E N C I A. Omnisciencia. Correcto. I feel so good about wanting because. You know, it's something like you wished and you wished for, and now you know you got it. It's like a magical moment that you feel. 
eighth grader Andres Ariola beat out the largest field of Spanish spellers that has come out to the Albuquerque event since it began five years ago. 26 spellers from eight different states. But compare that to the nearly 300 English spellers competing in the Scripps National Spelling Bee every year from every single state, as well as spellers from Japan, Europe and Africa. There's also the national ESPN TV coverage and the $35,000 cash prize awarded to winners of the Scripps Spelling Bee, compared to the $500 Ariola took home for winning the Spanish Bee. David Brezeno founded the National Spanish Spelling Bee to raise the status of Spanish language and boost bilingual education. He says a lack of funding and sponsors to financially support the event often means a lot of the nation's best spellers can't make it to the competition. I get a sense of loss because there's another student that could have been here that wasn't because of money. The Spanish spelling bee has a long way to go, but it's come a long way from humble beginnings in the Gadsden Independent School District near the US-Mexico border in New Mexico. Jose Reyes was teaching in the district when the Spanish bee began as a school versus school competition more than 20 years ago. We celebrate these champions. This is the fourth year running that a student from the 96% Hispanic school district has taken home the national title. It's no coincidence. Reyes says success has followed a major shift in educational attitudes towards bilingual students. He remembers how his own first grade teacher responded to him. I use Spanish and I remember her taking me to, to the sink in the corner of the classroom and washed my mouth with borax with the soap and said, you won't use this language again. On the other hand, Ariola just graduated out of the English language learner track. I didn't know any English when I came here. All while training to defend his Spanish spelling bee title. Now you're ready to play with the English speaking kids. But it's not just native Spanish speaking students like Ariola competing in the national Spanish spelling bee. About half the kids competing in the event are learning Spanish as a second language, coming from as far away as Virginia, Oregon and Massachusetts. I remember talking to somebody and they said, well, it, those Mexican kids ought to be doing pretty well in that, if they, you know, because they speak Spanish. I said, well, it's not, that's not how it goes. And by the way, I said, it's not all Mexican kids. Uh, this is a very diverse group of students that comes together from throughout the country to participate in the National Spanish Spelling Bee. Uh, if you were to take a look at the picture of those who've been participating, uh, you would take those words and eat them. Briseño says if the event is going to convince more American parents of the benefits of Spanish and bilingual education, it will need a lot more exposure. This thing needs to grow. I would love to see a network of sponsors nationally. I want to see representation from all 50 states. I'd like to see that representation of sponsors of networks and, and so that there are, there are sources of pay for, for, for our students that want to come in and participate. So parents don't have to, to take the brunt of, the, of, of having to pay for the airfare, the hotel costs. Next year, the competition will relocate to San Antonio, Texas, in hopes of reaching more bilingual students and a larger Hispanic media market. For the Fronteras Desk in New Mexico, I'm Simon Thompson. Investigation into San Diego YMCA finds nothing wrong, but are they in the clear? A best-selling author predicts a digital revolution in medicine, and one San Diego city is doing smart growth right. Join us for the roundtable tonight at 8.30 here on KPBS. Raise your glass, it's time for the annual festival celebrating beer and culture in the East County. Workers set up for La Mesa's Oktoberfest today. Some bartenders say they have one clear purpose. So our goal is to get the beers in your hand as quick as you want them so you can start dancing to the OOPA band. You heard her. Over 100 vendors are spread out on La Mesa Boulevard near 4th Avenue. Workers say La Mesa's Oktoberfest may have roots in the old world, but they also like the way Americans have reinterpreted it, the traditional German festival. I think America adopts these traditions and they kind of adapt them into making it Americanized, like bacon-wrapped hot dogs. <laughs> Beer is flowing right now at La Mesa's Oktoberfest. The festival continues tomorrow. Some call it the greatest show and tell at Balboa Park. Amitha Sharma has more on the weekend festival celebrating creative minds, young and old. 
Betting inventors will get a chance to show off their wares this weekend at the Maker Fair San Diego at Balboa Park. Mayor Kevin Faulkner has named it the Fall Centennial Event of 2015. Dale Doherty is the founder of Make Magazine and Maker Fair. He joins me now. What is a maker and what is the Maker Fair? Well, a maker is anybody who kind of creates a project and begins sharing it with other people. It could be a hobbyist, it could be a crafter, it could be an engineer. Could be a, a, a project that you do on your own in your garage or on a kitchen table, and you make something. And Maker Fair is a celebration of all the different kinds of making that occur in our community. Uh, uh, we wanted to highlight it as a way to invite more people to make things and, and get involved in whether they might have an interest in music or rockets or robots or or electronics to uh, bring all of that together and showcase it. So. Um, we can create more makers. So, you know, we have so many products available to us. Right. Um, what gave you the idea to create the Maker Fair? Well, I'd started a magazine, Make, and, and you could kind of think about it like a cooking magazine. It had recipes and how to make things yourself. But we wanted to kind of focus on cool things, things that often involve technology and new ways of making things. And I think today people make things because they enjoy the process of it, not just because it might be cheaper or easier to, to make something rather than to buy it, but it means something to us. It's very personal to make something. We might make something as a gift. We might make it to share with our friends. And it's an expression of who you are. And, and, and people say, oh, you make those things. So I think it's something that ha had been a little bit out on the margins of our culture and, and trying to bring it back in well, the that, middle. Well, that's what I was just about to ask you, is that do you think people have gotten away from that because so much is available I on the think, market? I think uh, very much so. I mean, we live in a culture of abundance where we can buy almost anything. And yet what we buy kind of bores us. It doesn't it doesn't make us happy. And I think making is something that is very personally rewarding. It's fun for kids, it's fun for adults. You, you start with a bunch of raw materials and you end up with something. They say, ah, that's mine. And, and then you could bring it to the event like Maker Fair and talk about it and talk about how you built it and where you got the materials and what was the idea behind it. So let's talk about that. So this weekend at the Maker Fair in San Diego, right. what can ex people expect to see and do and will it be interactive? Oh, absolutely. There's be a, a lot of hands-on activities and learning and and really it's a family event so we want adults and kids to come we think they'll all enjoy it it's fun I mean that is our main goal uh, create an event that's fun like a festival but instead of um, some festivals you've been to you're gonna be looking at some things that are, are almost visions of the future you know technology being used in unique and interactive ways and it might be a musical instrument it might be uh, a 19 foot tall giraffe it might be um uh, you know, a rocket that, that you go out and shoot in the desert. But you, what you're going to meet is a lot of smart people that have, have real passion for what they do, and, and it shows up in their eyes. And you could meet with them, ask them questions, and, and really learn from them what they do and what they love to do. Very quickly, what kind of attendance do you normally get at these maker fairs, and what sort of feedback do you get from people? Yeah, well, I, I get all kinds of feedback. Uh, we just did an event in New York City last weekend, Maker Fair and we had 95,000 people there. I don't think we'll get that here in San Diego this year, but someday we will. And, and I think we want everybody in the community to come out, teachers, um, kids, uh, uh, people that are interested in innovation, to come see these new things that, are, that people are, are demonstrating. So uh, I expect a really good crowd here. We did a Maker Faire here about a year and a half ago, and this is bringing it right really downtown in a, in a really nice way. We're going to close it there. Dale Doherty, thanks so much for coming on Thank the program. You. It's not a bird or a plane, but he's wowing the crowd at the Miramar Air Show. This is one of the high-flying acts. Just crane your neck and you will see amazing acrobats, uh, acrobatics by uh, military aircraft. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy talked with a woman who is making history with the Navy's Blue Angels. Blue Angels pierce through San Diego skies performing daring aerobatics. Katie Higgins will be in the cockpit of the C-130. She's my baby and I wouldn't want to fly anything else, that's for sure. Higgins is the first female Blue Angels pilot in the elite team's 70-year history. The 29-year-old U.S. Naval Academy graduate is a third-generation aviator. Her father flew a Hornet. She says earning her Blue Angels wings took perseverance. 
I studied really hard in flight school and it ended up paying off and a lot of it had to do with really great timing and and then I ended up uh, thankfully being selected for this position and it's uh, it's been a wild ride and it's awesome. Higgins has deployed to Afghanistan and has flown nearly 400 combat hours. She says she's never felt competition among her male co-pilots, just a lot of camaraderie. They see me just like one of their own, you know, they, uh, they treat me like their sister. They're uh, obviously protective just like they are of each other. And, uh, you know, I'm just a regular member of the ready room. Some of Higgins' daring air show maneuvers include 45-degree climbs, steep nosedives, and low passes. She says she feels honored to fly over Miramar. It's an awesome location because we are in a very large military presence. And that's why we exist, to, to remember and to bring attention to those people that are overseas still fighting to keep us free. She hopes she's paving the path for more women to join the team. Her advice, work hard. It's the hard times, it's the rough seas, it's the obstacles that you have to overcome that shape you as a person and shape me as a Marine and shape me as an aviator. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. A mild autumn weekend for the air show on tap for San Diego with a slight chance of some sprinkles Sunday morning. Looking at 70s over the next few days along the coast, 80s and 70s if you're in the Inland Valley area. Even cooler in the mountains with 70s and you see that 50s by Monday, 90s and 80s in the desert. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night and a great weekend.